Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, this is Pastor Sean, and I'm coming at you today with a new video where I'm going to be reading excerpts for the next hour for this week's video on the Master Plan of Evangelism by Dr. Robert E. Coleman with the Ford by Billy Graham. If you guys are new to the channel, then... Sorry about that. So if you're new to the channel, uh, what I like to do is I put out a video every Sunday. And so for... I actually already told you about what's going on where I'm reading this video. I'm going to be reading an hour's worth out of the book. And if you like it, go ahead and go on Amazon or go to your local bookstore and buy the book. The Master Plan, over 3.5 million copies sold. I actually was given this by my lady friend last week as a present. So I'm going to be going over this book. Normally I go over a complete different range of topics that has to do with the Bible. Uh, last time I did actual Bible study or sermons was a little while ago, but I've actually switched that to Wednesday nights. So I go live here, well not on here, but on Facebook I go live. Uh, right now, currently going through the book of Genesis and actually <clears throat> have finished the 12th chapter for Genesis. So what we're going to go ahead and do right now is go ahead and start with the Master Plan of Evangelism once again by Dr. Robert E. Coleman. <clears throat> hour-long excerpts. Section 1, or chapter 1, sorry, uh, selection. He chose from them 12, Luke chapter 6, verse 13. Men were his method. It all started by Jesus calling a few men to follow him. This revealed immediately the direction his evangelistic strategy would take. His concern was not with programs to reach the multitudes, but with men whom the multitudes would follow. Remarkable as it may seem, Jesus stated to gather these, started to gather these men before he ever organized an evangelistic campaign or even preached a sermon in public. Men were to be his method of winning the world to God. The initial objective of Jesus' plan was to enlist men who could bear witness to his life and carry on his work after he returned to the Father. John and Andrew were the first to be invited as Jesus left the scene of the great revival of the Baptist at Bethany beyond the Jordan. See John chapter 1 verse 35 through 40. Okay, continuing. Andrew in turn brought his his brought his brother Peter, which is in John chapter 1, verse 41 and 42. The next day, Jesus found Philip on his way to Galilee, and Philip found Nathanael, uh, 43 through 51. There is no evidence of haste in the selection of these disciples, just determination. James, the brother of John, is not mentioned as one of the group until the four fishermen are recalled several months later by the Sea of Galilee, See Mark chapter 1, verse 19, and Matthew chapter 4, verse 21. Shortly afterward, Matthew was called to follow the Master as Jesus passed through um, Capernaum. See Mark chapter 2, verse 13 through 14, Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, and Luke chapter 5, verse 27 through 28. The particulars surrounding the call of the other disciples are not recorded in the Gospels, but it is believed that they all occurred in the first year of the Lord's ministry. As one might expect, these early efforts of soul winning had little or no immediate effect upon the religious life of his day, but that did not matter greatly. For as it turned out, these few early converts of the Lord were destined to become the leaders of his church that was to go with the gospel to the whole world, and from the standpoint of its ultimate purpose, the significance of their lives would be felt throughout eternity. That's the only thing that counts. Next part, men willing to learn. What is more revealing about these men is that at first they do not impress us as being key men. Uh, none of them occupied prominent places in the synagogue, nor did any of them belong to the Levitical priesthood. For the most part, they were common laboring men, probably having no professional training beyond the rudiments 
of knowledge necessary for their vocation. Perhaps a few of them came from families of some considerable means, such as the sons of Zebedee, but none of them could have been considered wealthy. They had no academic degrees in the arts and philosophies of their day. Like their master, their formal education likely consisted only of the synagogue schools. Most of them were raised in the poor section of the country around Galilee. Apparently, the only one of the twelve who came from a more refined region of Judea was Judas Iscariot. By any standard of sophisticated culture, culture then, now they would surely be considered as a rather ragged collection of souls. One might wonder how Jesus could have ever used them. They were impulsive, temperamental, easily offended, and had all the prejudices of their environment. In short, these men selected by the Lord to be his assistants represented an average cross-section of society in their day, not the kind of group one would expect to win the world for Christ. Yet, Jesus saw in these simple men the potential of leadership for the kingdom. They were indeed unlearned and ignorant, according to the world standards. See Acts chapter 4, verse 13. But they were teachable. Though often mistaken in their judgments and slow to comprehend spiritual things, they were honest men willing to confess their need. Their mannerisms may have been awkward and their abilities limited, but with the exception of a traitor, their hearts were big. What is perhaps most significant about them was their sincere yearn, <coughs> or yearning for God, and the realities of his life. The superficiality of the religious Life about them had not obsessed their hope for the Messiah. See John chapter 1, verse 41, 45, 49, and then John chapter 6, verse 69. They were fed up with the hypocrisy of the ruling um, aristocrat, uh, aristocracy. Some of them had already joined the revival movement of John the Baptist. See John chapter 1, verse 35. These men were looking for someone to lead them in the way of salvation. Such men... Uh, pliable in the hands of the master could be molded into a new image. Jesus can use anyone who wants to be used. Next part, concentrated on a few. In noting this fact, however, one does not want to miss the practical truth of how Jesus did it. Here is the wisdom of his method, and in observing it, we return again to the fundamental principle of concentration on those he intended to use. One cannot transform a world except as individuals in the world in the world are transformed. The individuals cannot be changed except as they are molded in the hands of the master. The necessity is apparent not only in a select to select a few helpers, but also to keep the group small enough to be able to work effectively with them. Hence, as the company of followers around Jesus increased, it became necessary by the middle of the second year of ministry to narrow the select company to a more manageable number. Accordingly, Jesus called his disciples and he chose them from, from them twelve, whom also he named apostles. Luke chapter 6, verse 13 through 17. See also Mark chapter 3, verse 13 through 19. Regardless of the symbolical meaning of one prefers to put on the number twelve, it is clearly that Jesus intended these men to have unique privileges and responsibilities in the kingdom work. This does not mean that Jesus' decision to have 12 apostles included others for following him, for as we know, many more were numbered among his associates, and some of these became very effective workers in the church. The 70, which was in Luke chapter 10, verse 1, Mark, the gospel writer, and James, his own brother, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7, and Galatians chapter 2, verse 19 and 12. See also John chapter 2, verse 12, and John chapter 7, verse 2 through 10, are notable examples of this. Nevertheless, we must acknowledge that uh, there was a rapidly diminishing priority given to those outside the 12. The same rule could be applied in reverse, for within the select apostolic group, Peter, James, and John seemed to enjoy a more special relationship to the master than did the other nine. 
Only these privileged few are invited into the sick room of Yarius's daughter. See Mark chapter 5, verse 37, and Luke chapter 8, verse 51. They alone go up with the Master and behold his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. See Mark chapter 9, verse 2, and Matthew chapter 17, verse 1, and Luke chapter 9, verse 28. And amid the olive trees of Gethsemane, casting their ominous shadows in the light of the full Passover moon, these members of the inner circle waited nearest to the Lord while he prayed. See also Matthew. Uh, Mark chapter 14 verse 33 and Matthew chapter 26 verse 37. So noticeable is the preference given to these three that had it not been for the incarnation of self uh, selflessness in the person of Christ, it could well have participated uh, precipitated feelings of resentment on the part of the other apostles. The fact that there is no record of the disciples complaining about the uh, permanence of the three, Though they did murmur about other things, proof is proof that where preference is shown in the right spirit and for the right reason, offense need not arise. Okay, continuing here. The principle observed. All of this certainly impresses one with the deliberate way that Jesus propositioned his life to those he wanted to train. It also graphically illustrates a fundamental principle of teaching that other things being equal, the more concentrated the size of the group being taught, the greater the opportunity for effective instruction. Jesus devout just I screwed that up again. Jesus devoted most of his remaining life on earth to these few disciples. He literally staked his whole ministry on them. The world could be indifferent toward him and still not defeat his strategy. It even caused him no great concern when his followers on the fringes of things gave up their allegiance when confronted with the true meaning of the kingdom. See John chapter 6, verse 66. But he could not bear to have his close disciples miss his purpose. They had to understand the truth and be sanctified by it. John chapter 17, verse 17. Else all would be lost. Thus he prayed, not for the world, but for the few God gave him, out of the world, John chapter 17, verse 6 and verse 9. Everything depended on their faithfulness, and the world would believe in him through their word. Uh, John chapter 17, verse 20. Next part, not neglecting the masses. It would be wrong, however, to assume on the basis of what has been there what there's been emphasized that Jesus neglected the masses. Such was not the case. Jesus did all that any man could be asked to do and more to reach the multitudes. The first thing he did when he started his ministry was to identify himself boldly with the great mass revival movement of his day of baptism at the hands of John. See Mark chapter 1 verse 9 through 11, Matthew chapter 3 verse 13 through 17, Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. And he later went out of his way to praise his work of the great prophet. See Matthew chapter 11, verse 7 through 15. Luke chapter 7, verse 24 through 28. He continuously preached to the crowds that followed his miracle working ministry. He taught them. He fed them when they were hungry. He healed their sick and casted out demons from among them. He blessed their children. Sometimes a whole day would be spent ministering to their needs, even to the extent that he had no leisure so much as to eat. Mark chapter 6, verse 31. In every way possible, Jesus manifested to the masses of humanity a genuine concern. Uh, these were the people whom he came to save. He loved them, wept over them, and finally died to save them from their sin. No one could, no one could think that Jesus shirked mass evangelism. Next part. Uh, multitudes aroused. In fact, the ability of Jesus to impress the multitudes created a serious problem in his ministry. He was so successful in expressing to them his compassion and power that they once wanted to take him by force to make him king. John chapter 6, verse 15. One report by the followers of John the Baptist said, that all men were clamoring for his attention. 
See John chapter 3, verse 26. Even Pharisees admitted among themselves that the world had gone after him. John chapter 12, verse 9. And bitter as the admission must have been, the chief priests concurred in his opinion. Uh, John chapter 11, verse 47 through 48. Am I on the right page? Yeah. Uh, however, one looked at it. The gospel, re the gospel record certainly does not indicate that Jesus lacked any popular following among the masses. Despite their hesitating loyalty, and his condition lasted to the end. Indeed, it was the fear of his friendly mass feeling for Jesus that prompted his accusers to capture him in the absence of the people. Mark chapter 12, verse 12, Matthew chapter 21, verse 26, and then Luke chapter 20, verse 19. Had Jesus given any encouragement to his popular sentiment among the masses, he easily could have had all the kingdoms of the world at his feet. Uh, all he had to do was satisfy the temporal appetites and curiosities of the people by his supernatural power. Such was the temptation presented by Satan in the wilderness when Jesus was urged to turn, urged to turn stones into bread and to cast himself down from the pinnacle of the temple that God might bear him up. See Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 through 7, Luke chapter 4 verse 1 through 4, and then verses 9 through 13. These spectacular things would surely have excited the applause of the crowd. Satan was not offering Jesus anything when he promised him all the kingdoms of the world if the master would only worship him. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 through 10. <clears throat> the arch deceiver of men knew full well that Jesus automatically would have had would have this if he just turned his concentration from the things that mattered in the eternal kingdom. But Jesus would not play to the galleries. Quite the contrary, repeatedly, he took special pains to allay the super, um, superficial, super, I can't pronounce that word, popular support of the multitudes that have been occasioned by his extraordinary power. See John chapter 2, verse 23, and then chapter 3, verse 3, then chapter 6 of John, verses 26 through 27. Frequently, he would even ask those who were the recipients of his healing to say nothing about it to prevent mass um, de demonstrations by the easily aroused multitudes. Likewise, with the disciples following his transfiguration on the mount, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen until after his resurrection. See Mark chapter 9, verse 9, and Matthew chapter 17, verse 9. On other occasions, when applauded by the crowd, Jesus would slip away with his disciples and go elsewhere to continue his ministry. His practice in his respect sometimes rather annoyed his followers who do not or did not understand his strategy. Even his own brothers and sisters who yet did not believe in him, urged him to abandon his policy and make an open show of himself to the world, but he refused to take their advice. John chapter 7, verse 2 through 9. Now, next part. Few seem to understand. In view of his policy, it is not surprising to note that few people were actually converted during the ministry of Christ. That is, in any clear-cut way, of course, many of the multitudes believed in Christ in the sense that his divine ministry was acceptable, but comparatively few seemed to have grasped the meaning of the gospel. Perhaps his total number of devoted followers at the end of his earthly ministry numbered little more than the 500 brethren to whom Jesus appeared after the resurrection. See 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6. And only about 120 tarried in Jerusalem to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. See Acts chapter 1 verse 15. This number is not small considering that his active ministry extended only over a period of three years. Yet if at this point one were to measure the effectiveness of his evangelism by the number of his converts, Jesus doubtless uh, would not be considered among the most productive mass evangelists of the church. Guys, and before I continue reading here, I've noticed that this book has a lot of uh, 
parentheses and quotes of where you can find what Dr. Coleman is talking about, like the Johns, Matthews, Marks. I'm going to go ahead and skip over that because it feels like this is taking too long by reading those parts. So I'm just going to skip over those. Anyways, his strategy, continuing here. Why? Why did Jesus deliberately concentrate his life on comparatively so few people? Had he not come to save the world, with a glowing announcement of John the Baptist ringing in the ears of the multitudes, the master easily could have had an immediate following of thousands if he wanted them. Why then did he not capitalize on his opportunities to enlist a mighty army of believers to take the world by storm? Surely the Son of God could have adopted a more enticing program of mass recruitment. It is not rather disappointing that one with all the powers of the universe at his command would live and die to save the world. Yet in the end, have only a few ragged disciples to show for his labors? The answer to his question focuses at once on the real purpose of his plan for evangelism. Jesus was not trying to impress the crowd, but to usher in a kingdom. This meant that he needed people who could lead the multitudes. What good would it have been for the ultimate objective to arouse the masses to follow him if these people had no subsequent supervision or instruction in the way? It had been demonstrated on numerous occasions that the crowd was an easy prey to false gods when left without proper care. The masses were like helpless sheep wandering aimlessly without a shepherd. They were willing to follow almost anyone who came along with some promise for their welfare, be it friend or foe. That was the tragedy of the hour. The noble aspirations of the people were easily excited by Jesus, but just as quickly thwarted by the deceitful religious authorities who controlled them. The spiritually blinded leaders of Israel, though comparatively few in number, completely dominated the affairs of the people. For this reason, unless Jesus converts, Jesus' converts were given uh, competent men of God to lead them on and protect them in the truth, they would soon fall into confusion and despair, and the last state would be worse than the first. Thus, before the world could ever be permanently helped, people would have to be raised up who could lead the multitudes in the things of God. Jesus was a realist. He fully realized the fickleness of depraved human nature as well as the satanic forces of the world amassed against humanity. And in his knowledge, he based his evangelism on a plan that would meet the need. The multitudes of discordant and bewildered souls were potentially ready to follow him, but Jesus individually could not possibly give them the personal care they needed. <clears throat> This only hope was to get leaders inspired by his life who would do it for him. Hence, he concentrated on those who were in the beginning of his leadership. Though he did what he could to help the multitudes, he had to devote himself primarily to a few men rather than the masses, so that the masses could at last be saved. This was the genius of his strategy. Page 32. And next part, the principle applied today. Yet, strangely enough, it is scarcely comprehended in practice today. Most of, evan most of the evangelistic efforts of the church begin with the multitudes under an assumption that the church is qualified to perverse what good is done. The result of our spectacular emphasis on numbers of converts, candidates for baptism, and more members for the church with little or no genuine concern excuse me, manifested toward the establishment of these souls in the love and power of God, let alone the preservation and continuation of his work. Surely if the pattern of Jesus at this point means anything at all, it teaches that the first duty of the church leadership is to see to it that the, a foundation is laid in the beginning of which can be built an effective and continuing evangelistic ministry to the multitudes. 
This will require more concentration of time and talents on fewer people in the church while not neglecting the passion for the world. It will mean rising up trained disciples for the work of ministering with the pastor and church staff. A few people so dedicated in time will shake the world for God. Victory is never won by the multitudes. Some might object to the principle when practiced by the Christian worker on the ground that favoritism is shown toward a select group in the church. But be that as it may, it is still the way that Jesus concentrated his life and it is necessary if any lasting leadership is to be trained. Where it is practiced out of a genuine love for the whole church and due concern is manifested toward the needs of the people. Objections can at last be reconciled to the mission being accomplished. However, the ultimate goal must be clear to the worker that there can be no hint of selfish partiality displayed in the relationships to all. Everything that is done with the few is for the salvation of the multitudes. Next part, modern demonstrations. This principle of selectivity and concentration is engraved in the universe and will bring results no matter who practices it, whether or not the church believes it. Look at any successful leadership training program in business, industry, governments, or the military. On a global scale, it is surely not without significance that the early leaders of communism, uh, always alert to what works, adopted in a large measure this method of the Lord as their own, using it to their own devious ends, and, uh, and they have multiplied for a handful of zealots to a vast conspiracy of followers that until recently enslaved nearly half the people of the world. They are a modern day example of what Jesus demonstrated so clearly in his day, that the multitudes can be won easily if they are just given leaders to follow. Next part. It is time that the church realistically faced the situation. Our days of trifling are running out. The evangelistic program of the church has bogged down on nearly every front, especially across the affluent Western world. All right, everybody, let's continue here. Took off my shirt, and now it's daytime. Okay, we're going to continue with the master plan here for the next 30 minutes. Off of page 34, if you're following along. In many lands, then, in feeble church is not even keeping up with the exploding population. All the while, the satanic forces of this world are becoming mere relentless and brazen in their attack. It is ironic when one stops to think about it. In an age when facilities for rapid communication of the gospel are available to the church as never before, there are actually more unevangelized people on the earth today than before the invention of the horseless carriage. Yet, in appraising the tragic condition of affairs today, we must not become frantic in trying to reverse the trend overnight. Perhaps that has been our problem. In our concern to stem the tide, we have launched one crash program after another to reach the multitudes with the saving word of God. But what we have failed to comprehend in our frustration is that the real problem is not with the masses, excuse me, sorry, uh, what they believe, how they are governed, whether they are fed a wholesome diet or not. All these things considered so vital are ultimately manipulated by others. And for this reason, before we can resolve the exploitation of the people, we must get to those whom the people follow. This, of course, puts a priority on winning and training those already in responsible positions of leadership. But if we can't begin at the top, then let us begin where we are and train a few of the lowly to become the great. And let us remember, too, that one does not have to have the prestige of the, of the world to be greatly used in the kingdom of God. Anyone who is willing to follow Christ can become a mighty influence on the world providing, of course, this person has the proper training. Here is where we must begin, just like Jesus. It will be slow, tedious, painful, and probably unnoticed by people at first. 
but the end result will be glorious, even if we don't live to see it. Seen this way, though, it becomes a big decision in the ministry. We must decide where we want our ministry to count, in the momentary applause of population or popular recognition, or in the reproduction of our lives and a few chosen people who will carry on our work after we have gone. Really, it is a question of which generation we are living for. But we must go on. It is necessary now to see how Jesus trained his men to carry on his work. The whole pattern is part of the same method. And we cannot separate one face from the other without destroying its effectiveness. Chapter 2, Association. Lo, I am with you always. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. He stayed with them. Next part, or next chapter. Having called his men, Jesus made a practice of being with them. This was the essence of his training program just letting his disciples follow him. When one stops to think of it, this was an incredibly simple way of doing it. Jesus had no formal school, no seminaries, no outline course of study, no periodic membership classes in which he enrolled his followers. None of these highly organized procedures considered so necessary today entered into his ministry. Amazing as it may seem, all Jesus did to teach these men, his way was to draw them close to himself. He was his own school and curriculum. The natural informality of the teaching method of Jesus stood in striking contrast to the formal, almost scholastic procedures of the scribes. These religious teachers insisted on their disciples adhering strictly to certain rituals and formulas of knowledge which distinguished them from others whereas Jesus asked only that his disciples follow him. Knowledge was not communicated by the masters in terms of laws and dogmas, but in the living personality of one who walked among them. His disciples were distinguished not by outward conformity to certain rituals, but by being with him, Jesus, and thereby participating in his doctrines. Now, next part, to know was to be with. It was by virtue of his fellowship that the disciples were permitted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Knowledge was gained by association before it was understood by explanation. This was best expressed when one of the band asked, How, how know we the way? Reflecting his frustration at the thought of the Holy Trinity. Jesus replied, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Which was to say that the point in question already was answered. If the disciples would but open their eyes to the spiritual reality incarnated in their midst. This simple methodology was revealed from the beginning by the invitation that Jesus gave to the men he wanted to lead. John and Andrew were invited to come and see the phase where Jesus stayed, or the place where Jesus stayed. Nothing more was said. Yet, what more needed to be said? At home with Jesus, they could talk things over in their private, see intimately into the nature and work. Philip was addressed in the same essential manner. Follow me. Uh, evidently impressed by the sim this simple approach, Philip invited Nathaniel also to come and see the master. One Lemmy sermon is worth a hundred explanations. Uh, later when James, John, and Peter, and Andrew were found meeting their nets, or mending their nets, Jesus used the same familiar words, Come ye after me, only this time adding the reason for it, and I will make you fishers of men. Likewise, Matthew was called from the tax collector's booth with the same invitation, Follow me. Next part, the principle observed. Uh, see the tremendous strategy of it? By responding to his initial call, believers in effect enrolled themselves in the master's school, where their understanding could be enlarged and their faith established. There were certainly many things with these men which these men did not understand. These which they themselves freely acknowledged as they walked with him, but all these problems could be dealt with as they followed Jesus. In his presence they could learn all that they needed to know. This principle, which was implied from the start, was given specific articulation later when Jesus chose from the larger group about him to the twelve, that they might be with him. 
Okay. He added, of course, that he was going to send them forth to preach and to have authority to cast out devils. But often we fail to realize which came first. Jesus made it clear that before these men were to preach or to cast out devils, they were to be with him. In fact, this personal appointment to be in constant association with him was as much a part of their ordination commission as the authority to evangelize. Indeed, it was for the moment even more important, for it was necessary preparation for the other. Next part, closer as training ends. The determination with which Jesus sought to fulfill his commission is evident as one reads through the subsequent gospel account. Contrary to what one might expect, as the ministry of Christ lengthened into the second and third years, he gave increasingly more time to the chosen disciples, not less. Frequently, he would take them with him on a retreat to some mountainous area of the country where he was relatively unknown, uh, seeking to avoid publicity as far as possible. They took trips together to Tyre and Sidon to the northwest, to the borders of Decapolis and the parts of Dalmathua to the southeast of Galilee, and to the villages of the uh, Caesarea Philippi, I didn't pronounce that right, to the northeast. These journeys were made partly because of the opposition of the Pharisees and the hostility of Herod, which was the king at the time when Jesus was born, uh, but primarily because Jesus felt the need to get alone with his disciples. Later, he spent several months with his disciples in Perea, east of the Jordan. As opposition mounted there, Jesus walked no more openly among the Jews, but departed thence into the country near to the wilderness, in a city called Ephraim, or I should know that word, Ephraim, E-P-H-R-A-I-M, and there he tarried with his disciples. When at last the time came for him to go to Jerusalem, he significantly took the twelve disciples apart, for the rest as he made his way slowly to the city. In view of this, it is not surprising that during Passion Week, Jesus scarcely ever let his disciples out of his sight. Even when he prayed alone in Gethsemane, his disciples were only a stone's throw away. Is not this the way it is with every family as the hour of departing draws near? Every minute is cherished because of the growing realization that such close association in the flesh soon will be no more. Words uttered under these circumstances are always more precious. Indeed, it was not until time began to close and that the disciples of Christ were prepared to grasp many of the deeper meanings of the presence with them. Doubtless, uh, this explains why the writers of the Gospels were constrained to, devout, to devote so much of their attention in these last days. Fully half of all that is recorded about Jesus happened in the last months of his life, and most of this in the last week. Of course, following Jesus through his life was supremely portrayed in the days following his resurrection. Interestingly enough, every one of the ten post-surrection appearances of Christ was to his followers, particularly, excuse me, to chosen apostles. Okay, continuing here. <clears throat> so far as the Bible shows, not one unbelieving person was permitted to see the glorified Lord. Yet it is not so strange. There was no need to ex excite the multitudes with his spectacular revelation. What could they have done? But the disciples who had fled in despair following the crucifixion needed to be revived in their faith and confirmed in their mission to the world. This whole ministry evolved around them. And so it was, the time which Jesus invested in these few disciples was so much more by comparison to that given to others that it can only be regarded as a deliberate strategy. He actually spent more time with his disciples than with everybody else in the world put together. He ate with them, slept with them, and talked with them for most part of his entire active ministry. They walked together among the lonely roads. They visited together in the crowded cities. They sailed and fished together in the Sea of Galilee. They prayed together in the deserts and in the mountains. And they worshiped together in the synagogues and in the temples. Next part, still ministering to the masses. 
One must not overlook that even while Jesus was ministering to others, the disciples were always there with him. Whether he addressed the multitudes that pressed on him, conversed with the scribes and Pharisees who sought to ensnare him, or spoke to some lonely beggar along the road. The disciples were close at hand to observe and to listen. In this manner, Jesus' uh, time was paying double dividends. Without neglecting his regular ministry to those in need, he maintained a constant ministry to his disciples by having them with him. They were thus getting the benefit of everything he said and did to others, plus their own personal explanation and counsel. Next part, it takes time. Such close and constant association, of course, meant that Jesus had virtually no time to call his own. Like little children clamoring for the attention of their father, the disciples were always underfoot of the master. Even the time he took to go apart to keep his personal devotions was subject to interruption at the disciples' need. But Jesus would have it no other way. He wanted to be with them. They were his spiritual children. And the only way that a father can properly raise a family is to be with it. Next part, the foundation of follow-up. Nothing is more obvious, yet more neglected, than the application of this principle. By its very nature, it does not call attention to itself, and one is prone, excuse me, excuse me, one is prone to overlook the commonplace. Yet Jesus would not let his disciples miss it. During the last days of his journey, the master especially felt it necessary to crystallize their thinking about what he had been doing. For example, one turning to these who had followed him for three days, Jesus said, Ye shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. Page 44. Without any fanfare and unnoticed by the world, Jesus was saying that he had been training men to be his witness witnesses after he had gone. And his method of doing it was simply by being with them. Indeed, as he said on another occasion, it was because they had continued with him in his temptations that they were appointed to be leaders in his eternal kingdom, where they would each eat and drink at his table and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. It would be wrong to assume, however, that his principles of personal follow-up was confined only to the apocalypse apostolic band apostolic band just uh, jesus concentrated on these chosen few but also manifest concern for others who followed him but also manifested concern from others who followed him for example he went home with zacharias after his conversion on the streets of jericho see luke uh, chapter 19 verse 7 and he spent some time with him before leaving the city after the conversion of the woman at the well in Samaria, Jesus tarried two extra days in Sychar to instruct the people of that community who believed on him because of the word and of the woman who testified. And because of that personal association with them, many more believed. Not because of the woman's witness, but because they heard the master for themselves. Often, one who received some help from a master would be permitted to join the procession following Jesus as, for example, Bartimaeus, or Bart Bartimaeus, in such a way many attached themselves to the apostolic company, as is evidenced by the 70 with him in the later uh, Judean ministry. All of these believers received some personal attention, but it could not be compared to that given to the twelve. Uh, mention should be made, too, of that small group of faithful women who ministered to him out of their substance, like Mary and Martha, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, and many others. Some of these women were with him to the end. He certainly did not refuse their gracious kindness and often took the occasion to help them in their faith. Jesus welcomed their assistance, but did not try to incorporate these women into the select company of the chosen disciples. Jesus did not have the time to personally give all of these people, men or women, constant attention. He did all that he could, and his doubtless served, doubtless served to impress on his disciples the need for immediate personal care of new converts. 
but he had to devote himself primarily to the task of developing some leaders who in turn could give this kind of personal attention to others. The church as a continuing fellowship. Next part. Really, the whole problem of giving personal care to every believer is not only resolved in a thorough understanding of the nature and mission of the church. It is important here to observe that the emergence of the church principle around Jesus, whereby one believer was brought into fellowship with all others, was the practice and large dimension of the same thing that he was doing with the twelve. Actually, it was the church that was the means of following up with all those who followed him. Okay, now continuing. That is, the group of believers became the body of Christ, and as such, ministered to each other individually and collectively. Every member of the community of faith had a part to fulfill in his ministry, but with this, they only they could only do as they themselves were trained and inspired. As long as Jesus was with them in the flesh, he was their leader. But afterward, but thereafter, it was necessary for those in the church to assume this leadership. Again, oh, it was my part here. Again, this meant that Jesus had to train them to do it, which involved his own constant personal association with a few chosen men. Our problem. Next part. When will the church learn this lesson? Preaching to the masses, although necessary, will never suffice in the work of preparing leaders for evangelism. Nor can occasional prayer meetings and training classes for Christian workers do this job. Building men and women is not that easy. It requires constant personal attention, much like a father gives to his children. This is something that no organization or class can ever do. Children are not raised by proxy. The example of Jesus would teach us that it can be done only by persons staying close to those who they seek to lead. The church obviously has failed at this point, and failed tragically. There is a lot of talk in the church about evangelism and Christian nurture, but little concern for personal association when it becomes evident that such work involves the sacrifice of personal indulgence. Of course, most churches insist on bringing new members, though some kind of a confirmation class that usually meets an hour a week for a month or so. But the rest of the time, the young convert had has no contact with a, def with a definite Christian training program, except as he or she may attend the worship services of the church and the Sunday school. Unless new Christians, if indeed they are saved, have parents or friends who will fulfill who will fill the gap in a real way, they are left entirely on their own to find solutions to innumerable practical problems confronting their lives, any one of which could mean disaster to their new faith. With such haphazard follow-up of believers, it is no wonder that about half of those who make professions and join the church eventually fall away or lose the glow of a Christian experience and fewer still grow in sufficient knowledge and grace to be of any real service to the kingdom. If Sunday services and membership training classes are all that a church has to develop young converts into mature disciples, then they are defeating their own purpose by contributing to a false security. And if a new convert follows the same lazy ex example, it may ultimately do more harm than good. There is simply no substitute for getting with people, and it is ridiculous to imagine that anything less short of a miracle can develop strong Christian leadership. Uh, after all, if Jesus, the Son of God, found it necessary to stay almost constantly with his few disciples for three years, and even one of them was lost, how can a church expect to do this job on an assembly line basis a few days out of the year? That actually makes a lot of sense. And last part of chapter 2, the principle applied today. Clearly, the policy of Jesus at this point teaches us that whatever method of follow-up uh, the church adopts, it must have as its basis a personal guardian concern for those entrusted to their care. To do otherwise is essentially to abandon new believers to the devil. 
This means that some system must be found whereby every convert is given a Christian friend to follow until such time as he or she can lead another. The counselor should stay with the new believer as much as possible. Studying the Bible and praying with him or her, all the while answering questions, clarifying the truth, and seeking together to help others. If a church does not have such committed counselors willing to do this service, then it should be training some. And the only way they can be trained is by giving them a leader to follow. This answers the question of how it is to be done, but it is necessary now to understand that this method can accomplish its purpose only when the followers practice what they learn. Hence, another basic principle in the master strategy must be understood. Okay, and now I'm going to be reading for 10 more minutes to end this video. And then I'll throw a link in the description so you can look up uh, Dr. Robert E. Coleman. And yeah, let's go ahead and continue. So this is chapter 3, Consecration, Take My Yoke Upon You, Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. He required obedience. Jesus expected the men he was with to obey him. They were not required to be smart, but they had to be loyal. This became the distinguishing mark by which they were known. They were called his disciples, meaning that they were learners or pupils of the master. It was not until much later that they started to be called Christians, which is in Acts chapter, Acts chapter 11. Although it was inevitable for in time obedient followers variably take on the character of their leader. The simplicity of this approach is marvelous, if not astounding. None of the disciples were asked at first to make a statement of faith or accept a well-defined creed, although they doubtless recognized Jesus to be the Messiah. For the moment, all they were asked to do was to follow Jesus. Of course, clearly implied in their initial invitation, was a call to faith in the person of Christ and obedience to his word. If this was not comprehended in the beginning, it would be perceived as they continued in the way with the master. <clears throat> no one will follow a person in whom he or she has no trust, nor sincerely take the step of faith unless he or she is willing to obey what the leader says. The way of the cross. Next part. The way of the cross. Next part. Following Jesus seemed easy enough at first, but that was because they had not followed him very far. It soon became apparent that being a disciple of Christ involved far more than a joyful acceptance of the messianic promise. It meant to surrender of one's whole life to the master in absolute submission to his sovereignty. This could be, there could be no compromise. No servant can serve two masters, Jesus said, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one to despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. M-A-M-M-O-N. Mammon. Where have I heard that before? Uh, anyways, there had to be a complete forsaking of sin. Um, the old thought patterns, habits, the pleasure of the world, had to be uh, conformed to a new disciple's or to a new discipline of the kingdom of God. Perfection of love was now the only standard of conduct, and this love was to manifest itself in obedience to Christ, expressed in devotion to those whom he died to save. <clears throat> there was a cross in it, the willing denial of self for others. This was strong teaching. Not many people could take it. They liked to be numbered among his followers when he filled their stomachs with bread and fish. But when Jesus started talking about the true spiritual quality of the kingdom and the sacrifice necessary in achieving it, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. As they put it, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? Uh, the surprising thing is that Jesus did not go running after them to try to get them to stay on his membership role. <clears throat> He was training leaders for the kingdom, and if they were going to be fit vessels of service, they were going to have to pay the price. Count the cost. The next part. Those who would not go all the way thus in time fell by the wayside. They separated themselves from the chosen company by reason of their own selfishness. 
Judas, exposed as the devil, held on until the end, but at last his greed caught up with him. One simply cannot follow Jesus through the course of his life without turning loose of the world. And those who made a pretense uh, of it brought only anguish and tragedy to their souls. Okay, guys, and for the last part here, we are going to be ending on page 54 on the top where it says the hands of his enemies. And then I'm going to explain to you uh, what I put in the description there for if you would like to look up uh, this doctor right here and put some other links. So anyways, continuing for the last part of this. <clears throat> also, obviously, if you'd like to buy the book, forgot to mention that. Uh, perhaps uh, this is why Jesus spoke so severely to the scribe who came and said, Master, I will follow these whithersoever thou goest. Jesus frankly told this apparent volunteer for service that it would not be easy. The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. Another disciple warned to be excused from his immediate obligation of obedience, so that he might go and care for his aged father. But Jesus would allow no delay. Follow me, he said, and leave the dead to bury the dead. Go thou and publish abroad the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Another man indicated that he would follow Jesus, but on his own terms. He wanted the first bid farewell to his family, perhaps anticipating a merry good time doing it, but Jesus put it to him straight. No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Oh, that struck me right in the heart. Uh, Jesus did not have time nor desire to scatter himself on those who wanted to make their own terms of discipleship. Hence, it was that a would-be disciple was made to count the cost. For which of you desiring to build a tower doth not first sit down and count the cost, whether he have uh, wherewith to complete it? Not to do so was tantamount to inviting ridicule later from the world. The same would be true of the king in war who did not consider the cost of victory before hostilities began. To sum it up bluntly, Jesus said, Therefore, whosoever he be with you that recounteth not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Okay, next part. Few would pay the price. Actually, when the opportunists left him in Capernaum, because he would not satisfy their popular expectations, Jesus had only a handful of followers left. Turning to the twelve, he said, would ye also go to go away? This was a crucial question. If these few men quit following him, what would remain of his ministry? But uh, Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we have believed and know that thou art the Holy One of God. Indeed, these words of the apostle must have been reassuring to the master. For therefore Jesus began to talk with his disciples more about his suffering and death and with greater frankness. <clears throat> Excuse me, last part here for the video. To obey is to learn. This does not mean, however, that the disciples quickly understood everything the Lord said. Far from it. Their ability to grasp the deeper truths in the Lord's vicarious ministry was encumbered with all the limitations of human frailty. When Jesus told the disciples about the great affirmation at Cas... or... Caesarea Philippi, that he would be put to death by the religious leaders in Jerusalem. Peter actually rebuked him, saying, "Be far from the Lord; this shall be, this shall never be unto me." Whereupon Jesus had to tell the big fisherman that Satan deceived him at this point, for thou mindest not the things of God, but of men. Nor did this end it. Again and again, Jesus felt constrained to speak about his death and its meaning to them, but failed to comprehend it until the day he was betrayed into the hands of his enemies. So thank you guys for watching this video. Thank you for listening. Once again, uh, this actually has a foreword by Billy Graham, the great evangelist. Once again, this is the Master Plan of Evangelism by Dr. Robert E. Coleman. I'm going to put two links in the description there. For one, if you would like to buy this or any of 
other of his books and to read about him on a website that I found. So once again, uh, this is Pastor Sean, once again with the uh, Death Church podcast and the Good Battle Ministries, and God bless.